Um, so today I've titled, thank you everyone for coming. I look forward to our conversation on this topic. Um, I've titled my talk, Craft Computation, Craft and Computation, Culture, Design, and Education. Okay, so I'll just share some of my work with you. Uh, Dietrich spoke through probably <clears throat> a few slides that I had where I was just going to introduce myself. So that's taken care of. Thank you very much. Um, and like you mentioned, my work navigates between craft or traditional practices, however we think about traditional practices, digital practices, and how these things intersect with society. Um, so I examine practices, cultures, tools, communities, and the cultures of both. Um, some of the problems that I address in my work include the disappearance or erasure of craft knowledges and practices, the omission or exclusion, the omission or exclusion of these knowledges and communities from discourses around technology and design, and social and cultural problems of computation and design. Uh, questions that drive my work include one, how might computational ideas, methods, and technologies repair craft and cultural practices? And how might practices and labels in craft cultures repair how we think about computation or, or theoretical frameworks or computational ideas? And I use Senate's description of repair as a point of departure. I'm gonna take this off, okay? Um, as a point of departure comprising restoration, remediation, and reconfiguration, where he describes restoration as a recovery in which the damage and use of history is undone with the restorer as a servant of the past, remediation as that which preserves an existing form while substituting all the parts for new and improved ones, and reconfiguration as a radical kind of repair, one that is more experimental, where we explore the connections between the small repairs we might make and their larger implications, or larger consequences. And why is this important? What is the significance of this, <clears throat> of repairing craft and computational cultures and practices? One, to reveal new dimensions of craft practices. Two, to inform our theories or methods and or tools with social and cultural frames. Three, to create new communities, new expressions and relations. And four, to understand the effects of technology alongside human welfare, uh, since these technologies usually impact society's least privilege. <clears throat> the broader impacts of which include preventing the disappearance of craft knowledges and practices, undoing damages that might have occurred in the past and today, improving our current and future theories, technologies, and pedagogy, and considering smaller repairs you might make and their larger social implications. The vision of the work being to revive and reveal possibilities in craft for social, cultural, and technical advancements. So I'll show you how I go about doing this um, in my research, and I'll start with this case study. The case study being uh, a craft in the cultural design practice of the Trinidad Carnival. So this is an engraving from 1888 of Carnival celebrations in Port of Spain, Trinidad. French planters introduced Carnival to Trinidad in the 1780s, and during enslavement, Africans engaged in carnival festivities. But after slavery was abolished in 1834, they reinvented, or one might say repaired, carnival to celebrate their freedom, express their creativity and aesthetic sensibilities, and reclaim their humanity in the face of a system that considered them less than human. While for Europeans, uh, carnival was for fun and for frolic. For those of African descent, carnival was like a religion. It was cathartic and a psychological release of tensions from domination, segregation, and violent, inhumane systems of control. The term Trinidad Carnival or Trinidad and Tobago Carnival does not bound the geographic location of the carnival, um, but rather refers to its origin. It originated in Trinidad, and the main elements defining the Trinidad Carnival are mass or masquerade, steel pan or steel drum, 
and Calypso, which is the music native to uh, Trinidad and Tobago, right? But Carnival has spawned to other parts of the globe, the US, the UK, Canada, Europe, all around the world, right? As the diaspora has spread. Um, Carnival is about design and design and Carnival is about uh, celebrating resistance and emancipation from that enslavement. These are images of Jab Jab and Blue Devil characters in Juve in Carnival, and they originate from the celebration of resistance from enslavement. <clears throat> uh, Carnival and design is about creativity and joy. Uh, it's about these seemingly disparate things dwelling together, enslavement and freedom, good and evil, scary and beautiful. It's a space of entanglement. It's also rooted in community with social interaction and togetherness, mentoring and cooperation and community engagement. It's about public education. Um, this is a photo from 1957 of a band by George Bailey. Um, and here he was portraying his imagination of the title of the band was Back to Africa, of what that history would have looked like, right? And so I think of our carnival as the internet of that time um, for public education in art, in history, uh, in society. All of this is and was wrapped up in carnival with people portraying and educating their publics on histories, real and imagined, past and future. Carnival is also tectonic. Uh, these are kings and queens of carnival, which I define as dancing sculptures. Um, and these are large, as you can see, um, structures that people perform during carnival. And integral to these structures are uh, is the craft of wire bending, which combines elements of engineering, architecture, and sculpture to create these large three-dimensional forms or structures that are then covered and decorated for performance and for competition. Um, it began in the 1930s in Carnival, and in it, wire, fiberglass rods, and other linear materials are bent and shaped together to create these structures, which are expressions of creativity, innovation, and technical skill. Um, unfortunately, the craft is dying or it's at risk. On the left is expert wirebender Stephen Derrick performing wirebending. Unfortunately, he has since passed away. Um, and on the right is a photo from 1969 of a group of wirebenders. And historically, this has been a male-dominated practice. <clears throat> so in my ethnographic work at mass camps in Trinidad and Tobago, I was able to gain a better understanding of design and carnival. People have looked at carnival through social lenses, economic lenses, um, but there were some things that I had questions about and examining it through the lens of, through a design lens is, is what I took as my project. Uh, so understanding people, their processes, the traditions, the challenges and opportunities. And some of the issues that I found included little to no documentation of this particular craft of wire bending slow transmission of this knowledge, uh, dying practitioners, and changing practices in carnival due to global, societal, economic, and technological shifts. Um, but why should we care about these issues? Well, craft is embedded in historical, social, and political frames. Their disappearance signals the erasure of histories, cultures, identities, and more. Secondly, because this knowledge is tied to its practitioners, when they pass away, they take that knowledge with them, making it more challenging to pass on this culture and this knowledge. All of my uh, informants here have passed away since I've started my study. Um, thirdly, studies have shown that the quality of one's craftsmanship or craftspersonship is closely related to the strength of one's ties in a community. So strong craft skills, strong ties to a community, weak craft skills, weak ties to a community, and, and what we want are strong ties. Uh, and fourthly, think of these practices as languages. And so when these languages or ways of communicating with each other disappear, these ways of storytelling, ways of world making, then it's a, it's a lot more than a material practice that we're using, right? Consequences being 
the loss and trivializing of people's histories and culture, the disappearance of knowledge, the fragmenting of communities, and technological interventions and discourses that are devoid of context. So how might computational ideas, methods, et cetera, repair cultural practices like wire bending? Um, well, after you know, giving you a sense of the lay of the land, um, I'll show you some things that I've done in this realm, right? So to firstly address the idea of this craft that is undocumented, that is disappearing, um, to tackle this, I sought to actually document the practice, right? Um, and here I developed a computational tool to document that, that knowledge um, using rules and steps. So on the left is Stephen Derrick, one of the wirebenders I examined. And on the right, my descriptions of wirebending using symbols, operations, and rules based on my observations and interviews with him and others examining their artifacts and participating in the craft to make this tacit embodied knowledge explicit. And so I developed the Bailey Derrick grammar, which I named after Albert Bailey and Stephen Derrick. Um, and it's this is just a part of it shown on the screen. It's a lot more rules and steps involved, um, but it computationally describes technical knowledge in wire bending using a series of drawings representing materials, steps, and techniques allowing for analysis, synthesis, and the transmission, that was my hypothesis, of expertise for research, pedagogy, and practice. <clears throat> the grammar externalizes and formalizes tacit rules embedded in wirebenders and sheds light on the craft's computational domains, opening it up for expansion and inquiry. This is an example of how the grammar facilitates documentation of the design and fabrication process and how it can be used for teaching. Um, so it formalizes the rules embedded in wirebenders so that these rules are less tied to the originators, which is partly important when craftspersons are dying or retiring from practices, including this one. It facilitates documentation and opens up the practice for inquiry. Uh, it's written about in this paper. Uh, these are photos of Albert Bailey, who also passed away in September, uh, and Stephen Berry. Um, So this one is to test the hypothesis that I mentioned about it transmitting knowledge, right? And so I have this grammar, but does it really work? My hypothesis was that it can be used to teach and to teach this craft of water bending, of which there doesn't exist a current curriculum or any pedagogical structure for how to go about teaching it, right? Um, and so to test this, I conducted experiments and workshop in, with high school students and teachers in Trinidad. Uh, in the first part of the experiment, um, participants had to design and build artifacts using wire bending tools and materials. They're contextually aware of the craft, right? Um, so I wanted to get a sense of what they knew or didn't know. I then They then had to describe how they made their artifact to another team without the team seeing what they built, right? So they had to do this through drawings, no speaking. Um, and then on the second part of the exercise, I taught them the grammar, you know, um, so we demonstrated how we bend, et cetera. So there was a theory and a practice, so to speak. And then they did the exercise again. They would design and build their artifacts and with instructions, tell another team how to make their artifact, right? This time having the grammar at hand. So before learning the grammar, there was poor craftsmanship, conflicting standards and instructions, of course, lack of knowledge, missing information, and a, a general lack of confidence that was expressed by those participating in it, not being sure exactly what to do. Um, however, after learning the grammar, the, there was now improved craftsmanship, uh, an agreed standard for communication, it facilitated replication of artifacts, and there was a sense of increased confidence in terms of knowing what can be done or what they could do. Um, it facilitated restoration and replication of artifacts. In these photos, the artifact on the left of each photo is the orig original, the artifact on the right is a copy, and this is made merely by uh, teams swapping instructions, right? So technically it worked, 
or should I say work, right? Um, in its ability to transmit knowledge, to teach how to do how to do this craft and how to replicate artifacts via instructions. Uh, the most exciting part of it, however, for me, surprise, um, was that it facilitated a collaborative approach to the craft that currently doesn't exist. Wire bending is currently one-to-one -one, um, or one-to-many with one person meaning making one or many artifacts, but the grammar afforded this collaborative approach to bending where persons could participate in different roles. One could uh, document how things are being made. They could participate in, in, in bending artifacts. Because of the shared common language, there were now multiple people who could participate in making one artifact, which further um, augments or supports the communal and community nature of making and designing in carnival. Um, so yes, from design to documentation, fabrication and assembly, more people could engage in the craft together. Uh, I've written about this in this paper. <clears throat> now to the digital. So in part of my work, I explore how technology can be integrated in practices, right? Um, and so I develop three digital ways in which people might be able to engage in wire bending because the craft is labor intensive. And like I mentioned previously, it's male dominated. And so there aren't many kids participating. There's a question of who participates and who does not participate in the craft, right? Um, so this was done to address participation, to address the absence or lack of women, uh, children and those with physical limitations in the craft since it requires a kind of dexterity. Um, so I developed three methods. One using the grammar, that being the computational crafting, and the middle one using CNC wire bending and software tools, and on the right, uh, 3D printing and uh, design software, design and fabrication software that I developed. I tested this with my students. Um, these are images of some of the artifacts they made using the Bailey Direct Grammar and hand tools. Bear in mind, these students did not know about wire bending before. These are my students here at Georgia Tech. Right, so contextually, they knew little to nothing about wire bending, and of the eleven students, only one mentioned having experience in wire bending. And uh, this is using CNC wire bender. Some of the artifacts they've made. Um, this is a representation of some of what happens with the experimental pad tool that I develop, and these are some of the some images of the artifacts that they develop. Um, so these studies demonstrated that one could learn craft through computation and one could learn computation through a craft, bringing together um, those interested in craft and computation together, bringing together multiple intelligences of visual reasoning, calculating sensory material perception, bringing, all, bringing them together in design. The work here forecasting a new community of wire vendors and computational designers. Uh, I've written about this here. Um, and as an architect, of course, I have questions about structures, tectonics, what might this craft look like if we were to express it in the uh, sphere, in the field of architecture. And so after teaching my students these computational ways of bending at the architectural scale we wanted to build an installation, from that grammar that I showed previously, we built new connections, which we also tested um, to test their structural capacities and abilities or limits. And this is a pavilion that we built using these wire bending techniques. So here we have hints of a new poetics of construction that highlight a local craft, a history, a people, and a place. Um, where we are now seeing wire bending in ways that might engage those outside the domain of costuming and the domain of architecture, the domain of carnival even, demonstrating how different communities can engage with the history and the future of a craft or wire bending beyond the domain of carnival. It also advanced the Billy Derek grammar with new rules and steps based on experimenting at this architectural scale. Uh, this is a photo of my students and I, and I've <clears throat> written about uh, this here in what I call computational regionalism, where we, how we talk about the placelessness that is often a thing sometimes in architectural computation, 
but how we translate local craft practices into te tectonic languages for new interpretations and poetics of construction. Um, here, also drawing from that study, my colleagues and I discuss craft-centered approaches to how we talk about questions of access and equity when it comes to digital fabrication and digital tools. And this is another small pavilion project um, that my students and I made where in this project, we were challenging um, this particular structural typology of active bending structures. And we wanted to, it's very highly technological nowadays. So there's simulation software, um, because these projects are um, difficult to predict, there's a lot of technical and technological infrastructure that currently goes into analysis for them, building them, et cetera. But we wanted to challenge these very highly technological approaches. And um, we wanted to employ a sort of grounded approach that uh, was did not keep people out because of simulation, the cost involved in these uh, infrastructures, et cetera. We wanted to challenge that. And so we wanted to broaden that design space to include those currently missing from the field, those not highly resourced when it comes to technology or expert knowledge of software simulation tools. We wanted to stress social, cultural, and technical knowledges of a setting and their relationships to active vending, local craft, and techniques. Uh, so on the left is an image of, from 1984 of uh, Kalaloo, a band by Peter Minchel, where he employed active vending techniques or concepts in making these textile hybrid costumes. And on the right, we pulled from that um, and from our analyses of our larger pavilion I showed you before, to come up with a typology uh, that kind of combines both. Uh, in the front here, you see a scaled model of our uh, pavilion in the back, the large one we did before. And this was for a lightweight structures uh, exhibition in Spain. So we had to carry our pavilion or our structure to Spain. It had to be lightweight. Um, this was our pavilion on the left. This was in 2019. Uh, my students and I on the left, this is how we packaged our entire pavilion. It, it was made out of fiberglass rods in a drum case, assembled it in Barcelona, came back, um, while other teams had these huge containers for what was supposed to be a likely competition, but it was fun. Um, this is our project. And so we exhibited by this how we can bring together existing knowledges and skills and in craft and design and carnival and speculate around reintroducing these structures or pavilions back into that context of carnival, so how it, how it could be used, right? Um, showcasing active bending during carnival festivities, um, having or making these structures such that children, adults, and others could participate using local skills and knowledge to make these structures. Um, in, in ways that are socially, materially, and culturally um, considered together. Uh, I've written about this here on this paper. Uh, in this particular project, I bring together machine learning and culture. In this project, this is kind of an ongoing project, um, but this was fun fu funded by the Mozilla Foundation. Um, and the Paul was around racial justice and artificial intelligence. And my approach to the project was one of using AI and machine learning to celebrate cultures, histories, design, and creativity in Carnival. I wanted to use machine learning as a creative partner uh, and to include people in this context in the discourse of AI. So the project is about AI, the cultural history, and design practice of Carnival. It builds on previous work that I've done in digital heritage and how we interact and display with spatial, kinetic, historic artifacts and architectures, as well as work in uh, structures drawing from costuming and carnival. The two questions framing this project were how might we educate our publics about AI and machine learning through familiar cultural design practices? 
And how might we educate our publics about the Trinidad Carnival or other uh, cultural practices through AI and machine learning? <clears throat> and the vision was an empowered creative community that engages with, learns about, and interrogates AI to benefit themselves and contribute to global discourses on AI through cultural practices in Carnival, because we are already implicated in big data and our politics. And I mean, not just globally, but nationally in the Caribbean. So what might the result be if we explore what machine, machine learning does, building a data set of dancing sculptures? So you know, we built a data set of dancing sculptures, many of them, um, to explore what machines might imagine, right? What, what impact it might have, how we might reconnect people to histories, connect them to futures or possible futures, while also having an impact on design and making in carnival. So these are some imaginaries, things that the machine uh, envisioned for us. As a video, I like it very much. I like how it morphs. Uh, these are some of the images pulled from that. Now, what these things are, I'm not sure, of course, right? We still have to figure out what they are, but they are definitely very, very provocative. Um, these are AI-generated images of blue devils and jab jabs and juve, like I showed previously. Um, but the project doesn't end there in that it's it's more than the creation of these things. Uh, I made a virtual exhibit to showcase these uh, artifacts. And so in this space, when people go in this space, they, there's audio and video describing, uh, talking about carnival, carnival's history, but also educating those who enter about what AI is, uh, what machine learning is. So educating both, again, as a space for many to come together in. Uh, this is... Uh, a video, small video of the AI sort of juve. Um, juve is, is a different kind of feel and energy in Carnival, but this one showcases AI generated blue devils and jab jab. So feel free to go in the space. It's a it's a happy place. Okay. Um, so there were three main virtual um, sort of spaces that I created for. Uh, this happened especially during the pandemic where we did not have carnival for one year and you feel when carnival is coming. So not being able to engage in carnival, your body could feel it. And so this was a kind of digital space that we could all enter in and get a sense of, of carnival, right? Um, the work from this was, was on exhibition in Berlin. It just ended this month. Um, these are some images from uh, the exhibition that I just wanted to share. So what does all of this mean? What's the takeaway? Um, how might these labors in craft culture, all the things I've shown before, how might they make us rethink or think about uh, computation, the theoretical frameworks and methods that we use or develop? Well, um, it helped me develop what I call a situated computations uh, approach or framework. Uh, currently, there are eight principles to this framework. It includes research being built on ethnographic studies, building on existing skills and knowledges, building communities, um, being narrative and telling people stories. These are just a few of them. Um, but it's an approach to computing, or I argue, to research, practice, and pedagogy that grounds our tools or methods and theories in the social world by acknowledging their historical, cultural, and material contexts. It responds to a setting's social and technological infrastructure and refuses to remain ignorant of social and political structures that shape them. It attempts to create space for those participate for participation by those who are missing from our fields, our classrooms, however you want to frame that. It resists the segregation and privileging of intelligences and skills, because there's definitely that. Um, it amplifies the stories of historically excluded or marginalized groups, and it's serious about repatriating knowledges. So not just taking knowledges from context, but putting that knowledge back into context to test, have it rub up on people in, this, in the sites who have given us knowledge, right? Uh, it's written about in this paper here. 
Um, and so, right, so that's it. Uh, the vision behind all of my work is how craft cultural practices, uh, how they inform ways we think about technology, how, we, how these things butt up against so society, culture, et cetera, and technology. And before I close, I have an exhibition that is uh, a Graham Foundation funded exhibition that's supposed to be opening tomorrow, but let's say let's say Thursday, all right, um, at the Price Gilbert Gallery at Georgia Tech, and everyone is welcome to have, come have a look. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I maybe think about a lot of projects that are ongoing to try and recover and repair cultural elements. In particular, it made me think of efforts to both save and then revitalize languages. Mm -hmm. I mean, the language of grammar is an immediate sort of prompt for that kind of thinking. Yeah. But when I think about these efforts to try and catalog and revitalize language, I wonder about some of the risks in doing so. Uh -huh. uh, particularly the risks of, say, emphasizing one kind of dialect over another. Uh, one maybe local group practices over another. And I wonder if there are similar kinds of risks in your project of trying to develop grammars, uh -huh. build them into computational systems, uh -huh. that it might emphasize, say, one dialect over another. And then through these processes, as you say, of transmission and making it very accessible, ends up swamping out other world conditions. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you might be able to speak Yeah, I always love that question. Thank you very much. Um, and my response to it is it depends on the context. So for example, um, kind of similar to your question, sometimes people ask about, okay, what if someone else in another region takes this craft and they're making millions of dollars or something like that, right? And my response to it is, um, addressing the problem of that context. So in this particular context of craft wire bending in the, Trinidad, in the context of Trinidad and Tobago, by the reduction in the sort of ways of making as cultures, that ability to form communities and have strong communities is going away, right? So the value of that context is one of community the values of somewhere else might be something else. So, so if and when that grammar goes somewhere else, it might reinforce or not based on the values of that particular community, right? But currently the value in this context of Trinidad and Tobago is one of where communities are being fragmented. We're losing the ability to innovate based on these histor history, historical practices of making. That's a value that we want back, right? Um, so I hope I've answered your question, but I, I feel like the answer is very context specific. And to some degree, once you let the genie out of the bottle, it's hard to get back, right? But the need of this community at this time is the practice is dying. It's changing how can the aesthetics of carnival in that there's a cut and paste kind of bikini and beads aesthetic that does not, let me, let me not say nothing. It does not continue the lineage of this history, brings another one, which is good, it's okay, but it's for that history in which the carnival is grounded and these peoples and how acts of making have, um, have been ways that they've expressed their creativity and humanity. When that is passing, I think we have, we have to ask or think about those questions. You know? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Thank you. Did you say Dr. Kate had a question? And she had her hand up. So I don't know where would she ask. And um, enjoyed uh, immensely your research and 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 on Carnival. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we're in. You're wonderful. 
and and you may not know, but we're working on a uh, Emory Arts is working on a project to bring the Praise House, uh, a mock Praise House, to campus. Mm -hmm. uh, to Glen Memorial Church uh, out in the community in um, Decatur at Beacon Hill, which is a, a former location of a housing project. And then also to South Atlanta, uh, South Atlanta to Southview Cemetery, which was a um, an all black, or it is an all black cemetery. So the first praise house was held at uh, Oakland Cemetery, honoring the lives of over 800 unmarked graves. And I'm giving you some background and context because this praise house is also where the ring shout was uh, performed. Uh, and wondering, any, if, are you aware of any connections between the ring shout and the dances of carnival? That we're, we're trying to trace those connections, those African connections. Yes, thank you. Um, so I came to Emory for that wonderful event that you all have uh, had on that Sunday. Dr. Julie Johnson, who was moderating it, invited me to it. It was beautiful. Um, and one of the dancers, she was, uh, I think she mentioned in her bar that she too performed in Trinidad and Tobago. And I am not certain, but there are familiarities I see between the ring shout dance and the dance of uh, Shouter Baptist in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, that's the only connection I would safely make at this time because I don't know much of the sphere around that, but the dance of Shouter Baptist, our ballet, our, our dances around the traditional dances that may or may not be part of carnival, I definitely saw parts of it in that uh, ring shot performance uh, on that Sunday. So that's a point of departure or start that um, what I'm seeing is I do see connections. Being certain about that uh, would be something I need to check upon. Thank you, thank you. And I will say that we're, you know, um, the interior of the praise house will have a projection uh, installation, uh, but certainly, um, I'm seeing some of the things that you're doing with the the AI that would be very intriguing to explore for and you know an updated augmented reality of going into the praise house um, you know, using some of the images from uh, Rose Library and and what you're doing. So we'll have to talk with you more. Absolutely, thank you. So many questions what kind of change has unfolded with respect to these structures you know, over time? Let's say over again, right? Is it really just being just being a set of kind of general pattern, or do you see is there sort of a trajectory kind of changes? When you say structures, which one of the structures? I guess I'm about. Right, and so tell me your question. Say your question again. If I'm if I'm noticing a change in their sort of aesthetic, how they're built. Yes. Yeah. So my study started because when it comes to the costuming level, not dancing sculptures as yet, I was noticing a, a bikini and beads and feathers aesthetic of the carnival that was very different, more Brazilian aesthetic that was different from the carnival that I was accustomed to seeing, right? So that's where the question started about why this was happening. And some of the answers to that question was around the dying of these making practices that would actually form and sculpt co costumes, right? It was also related to the fact that carnival used to be majority male, uh, uh, I forget, Pamela Franco, I think, was the uh, scholar who wrote on the difference in gender in Carnival, which was previously male-dominated. Now, female-dominated, the aesthetic difference was also um, because of that, right? So there were these different reasons. Um, and my response to that, or my little filling that gap, was that there were problems in design. Problems being that carrying on these making practices um, because of sort of a shortage of 
developing our own local practices, these more global ones and aesthetics of bikini, beads, and feathers were coming into the carnival because um, they were easier to engage in rather than the technical skill of wire bending and that knowledge wasn't being passed. Uh, and actually, you know, I'm uh, very interested in the uh concept uh, and execution of having a, of a grammar graph practice. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how this, this grammar works in terms of, I, mean, I guess, uh, uh, classically, you think of there being like a, a lexicon and then the rules for the combination. Mm -hmm. um, and what would be the, the lexicon? What would be the rule? What are the things? Is it the wires that are being combined or is it the ways of combining the wires that are being combined? Mm -hmm. Or is there kind of a hierarchical organization to this? Or? Yeah, it, it's about the, the vocabulary, so the material vocabulary, and how they are connected. And that's based on examining the artifacts that wirebenders had um, and asking them why they did some of the things they did, right? So that of course, that could inform how and what was done. And with those rules that are based on materials and how same and different materials come together, when it comes to further developing it, for example, at the architectural scale, because for now, much of it is kind of a hypothesis, if not already seen, right? And so, for example, those for the pavilion, we structurally tested those so we could test friction, we could test tensile strength so that we could say, okay, yeah, this works versus having something that is abstract but really doesn't hold up to something. Um, so moving forward, or as it continues to grow, let me put it that way, um, it's about being able to structurally test these connections so that um, it's more than drawings with rules, but they have uh, some sort of integrity behind them yeah, with the materials that are being used. Yeah, so that's an interesting dimension too. The other thing about grammar is that they're supposed to you know, produce legal strings. Mm -hmm. you know, what are the, the rules? Uh, I, I hear you saying maybe the rules are things that are structurally possible. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's more, it can generate things other than something a traditional wire vendor ever would Correct. have. Like, mm -hmm. So it's not legal in the sense of conforming to, to, to traditions, mm -hmm. right? but uh, in fact, uh, more so about the, the structural possibility. Of yes, and, and opening it up to new new tectonics and new combinations of ways that we might put things together to test. Um, and as you mentioned, that one um, other thing, I, I don't know if you would like, but um, while in traditional uh, so the display for carnival is decorated um, in ways I've been thinking about it. I really try to celebrate the materials and the tectonics. So it's not so much about the decoration, right? On, on my side as a researcher, I'm not trained to, to be doing those things. Um, but I like the aesthetic of being able to see these, these how these different materials are coming, coming together in the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's ask a, a quick one. Yeah. Um, thinking about some of the work that Rupert does, yeah. do you think about applying the situated computational approach to places where you don't have the kind of knowledge that you're building on mm -hmm. right, after you have study? Mm -hmm. Do you think about excavating traditions and repairing them based on trace evidence or on you know, limited kinds of documentation? Uh, and uh, I wondered if you could see a little bit about how this kind of approach might help repair traditions, mm -hmm. repair craft knowledge that might have already been lost. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and I'm, but by that, I mean, it depends on what we have access to, would be my, my very uh, cautious response to, to your question. Um, for example, all of my informants have passed away, right? If I didn't start this 30 years ago, I would not have had them. There is documentation about the carnival, world, right? About their, their images and things that have been made, but not granular enough that we could see how they made what they made, right? So that is in this particular context. 
Um, in other cultures, other regions, things are very well documented. Um, and for me, it, that's what I want to do, attempt to archive, excavate possibilities for past knowledges and how we bring them back. Or I, I don't know, but that's my big desire. Um, and I think how that happens and ways in which it fails, um, I'm going to learn as I attempt to do those things, to, to attempt to reconstruct things that aren't there, I think would be my answer to your question. Um, in particular, knowledges, practices, people and communities that um, either we don't know about or who have been purposefully left out, um, whose stories have not been told. Um, those are the communities and practices I desire to focus on. Yeah. There, I had a, another question just to follow up on the material. I see the wire bending, but the colored, is that fabric or what is what is the uh, medium? And the pavilion, it's fabric. And this particular image that you see here, this was feathers um, that actually Stephen Derrick, this was his uh, creation. But it's it's it ranges from fabric to majority fabric um, to sometimes making sort of papier mache structures. It runs the gamut of how and what people make. But the wire is the um, kind of like the uh, what do you call it in um, sculpture? The uh... The main structure, structure, yes. And that's mm -hmm. yes. And so they sometimes use wire, fiberglass rods, cane, bamboo, some uh so Roland St. George, for example, uh he would weld his rod. So he used that he used steam and welded his materials to make his structures. It seems like how heavy is that? So the one of the main things about competition when it comes to these dancing sculptures is that you must be able to perform them. So we don't have floats like the Brazil Carnival that where they are on wheels and they're driven, right? Um, people must perform them. So how light they are or how dynamic they are, that's uh, a competition sort of value, um, but they can be heavy. The answer being whoever is performing that costume must be able to perform it comfortably. Have to be strong enough. <laughs> yeah. Or it must be such that it's 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 designed in such a way that it uh it's still dynamic and does all the things the designer wants it to do while being light, right? So for example, um let me if I go back here to let's say the project by Peter Mitchell, where he used fiberglass rods. That was a new sort of approach that he brought to the carnival um, that made these costumes very light. And he had uh, uh, two puppets that he called the Tan Tan and Saga Boy that were almost reverse puppets. They blew Trinidad away, um, but they were very light, right? So it, there were innovations that were happening in, in carnival around how we make these structures lighter, more dynamic, et cetera. So that's ongoing, I would say, to some degree. Yeah. Well, uh, if I could uh, step in again, then yeah. uh, another aspect of this that I find very interesting is sort of the relationship between the grammar that I just asked about, which is kind of a very uh, conceptual or computational thing, and the actual uh, embodied skill of manipulating yeah. objects and the dexterity that you yeah. referred to. Yeah. And it seems to some extent you're attempting to separate those from each other. Is that possible? But you're also using the grammar to teach uh, people. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, that interaction, what is lost if you just focus on the grammar mm -hmm. or uh, is this a particular craft in which the design elements are amenable to this sort of computational representation mm -hmm. in a way that some others wouldn't be? Or, uh, sure. Um, I like how you asked that. Um, so in my redefinition of the craft of wire bending, I include that it includes the social, it includes the body. Um, 
with devoid of that, it's not, this is again my perspective, it's not wire bending because wire bending comes with these communal and embodied in ways of engaging in the practice, right? So the abstracting or the separating of the body and, and sort of representation of knowledge is for to aid in transmitting it. But when it comes to actual engagement, I, I have to demonstrate to my students or learners how you actually do things, right? So there's the theory, if we want to call it that, and then the actual practice for how you go about making these connections. Um, yeah, so it, it's taking from one to augment both in a way, right? Yeah. yeah, so that people could understand and see why or what they're bending. Um, yeah. And uh, do you have a, a sense of uh, how long it takes somebody to be competent in, uh, in this? And is that mostly give them a target and then uh, it's a bunch of individual just practice? Uh, or how, how, did that, how did that work? I, I am learning too. And my students who helped with that pavilion, and then when we all made this, this was a semester, right? Um, they got strong at the end of it. Um, but I, I think it depends on what you're doing. We had a project, and so I was able to tell them what to do. We could test things in a way that we were uh, learning from each other and learning as things arose. But I would not say that any one of them, nor myself, is a particular expert at what I'm learning. I'm, I'm I'm, I'm a, I call myself a philosophical wirebender. I'm not a real wirebender like a real wirebender, right? Um, so I don't have the answer for that, but these wirebenders have been doing wirebending for tens of years and well, have since passed away, but you know, it's been many years they were doing it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.